circumscribed because of certain kinds of political structural arrangement. And then what happens is the evisceration of freedom and eclipse of justice. And I'm quoting a stanza from a poetry. For while the rubble, rubble with their thumb-worn creeds, their large professions and small deeds, mingle in selfish strife, for, for lo, freedom weeps, wrong rules the land, and waiting justice sleeps. I'm quoting from Life of Abraham Lincoln by Joseph Gilbert. This situation is characteristic of a democratic republic. Shunning direct democracy, it elects to create a top heavy superstructure of representative democracy that we have today in India and elsewhere. By doing so, it preserves the traditional structure of political organization that makes the apex of the system the source of authority and power. In this system, influences of all sorts flow downwards. It is these influences that determine the character of the political system at large. Even federal system of governments does not easily escape the overbearing influence of the national government. This is well illustrated by the examples of two countries, United States of America and India. Both these countries won their freedom after launching a successful revolution against an alien ruler. They had then to face the task of installing a new body politic that would be equipped with a political institutional arrangement capable of capable of supplying the exercise of supporting the exercise of freedom by all. After all, both these countries launched freedom struggle not only to gain freedom, but also to retain it. And the retaining of freedom was to enable not a few, but all the citizens to exercise their freedom. This is an important task. Revolutions represent only a transitional stage. They wipe out the slate, signifying the closure of the past. It has to be written upon again by installing a new body politic. This signifies that the course of history suddenly begins anew, an entirely a new story, a story never known or told before is about to unfold. The plot of this story may, as uh, Alexis Stock Bill suggested long ago, be shrouded in obscurity. However, the moral of the story is never in doubt. It is neither insignificant nor ambiguous. This moral is, of course, the celebration of freedom. It opens the way for every citizen to exercise freedom, not only to mold his own destiny, but also to participate in the task of giving a preferred direction to collective political life and relations. This is possible only when a proper institutional support base is provided to freedom so that it is not prevented from making its appearance. The story that grandmothers tell always ends with a good triumphant over the evil. However, this does not apply to the formation of a new body politic. What happens is that the demon of highly centralized political order 
appears to put freedom in fetters and deny it a space where it could make its much awaited appearance. The experience of the United States of America and India testifies to it. The American experience is particularly instructive since it brings to the fore the factors that got put freedom in fetters. It was against this sacrilegious act that Thomas Jefferson argued and suggested what he called elementary republics to replace it for safeguarding freedom. The Constitutional Convention that sat in Philadelphia called to mind the bitter experience during the War of Independence. Alexander Hamilton set the tone when he inveighed against direct democracy. Direct democracy must be, by definition, involve the splintering of a large body politic into small political bodies. However, he pointed out that if men are ambitious, vindictive, and rapacious, so are states. He argued that most frivolous and fanciful distinctions have been sufficient to kindle their unfriendly passions and excite their most violent conflicts. Referring to the examples of Greece and Italy, he pointed out that they were constantly agitated. The rapid succession of revolutions kept them in a state of perpetual vibration, moving between the extremes of tyranny and anarchy. If they exhibited occasional calms, they only serve as occasional contrast to the furious storms that are to succeed. Hamilton characterized direct democracies to be an infinity of little, jealous, clashing, tumultuous commonwealths, the nurseries of unceasing discord, and miserable objects of universal pity or contempt. James Madison also declared them to be the spectacles of turbulence and contention. He found them as short as their lives, as they have been violent in their deaths. This is due, he argued, to the nexus that is formed among liberty, interest, and opinion. The reason for this is the primacy of economics in modern times. Madison argued that the regulation of economic life and relations constitutes the principal task of the government and of legislation. This necessarily involves the spirit of parties and factions. In, in the necessary and ordering operations of the government. Most acts of legislation are nothing but the political determination concerning the rights of large bodies of citizens. By the same token, different classes of legislators are advocates and parties to the cause they determine. For medicine then, all decisions about economic policy involve questions of private rights and of justice, since the primacy of interest transforms the question of justice into a burning question. Interest breeds faction, and liberty proves to faction what the air is to the fire. It fans the fire of hunger for ever more positions and proofs instrumental in dividing the society into antagonistic, hostile economic camps, each 
sticking to its own vision of what is good for others. Moreover, it is interest that plays a decisive role in the formation of opinion. Thus, the interplay among liberty, interest, and opinion throws a multiplicity of interest and a diversity of opinions, which become the cause of the fragmentation of society into highly contentious groups. This is symptomatic of the coming to prominence of self-regarding action that swamps the public spirit and goes a long way to deaden it. Shareable commonality is lost and society is turned into an armed arena where, as McIntyre points out, civil war by other means goes on unabated. When a majority based either on passion or interest becomes the ruling faction, it tends to sacrifice to its ruling passion or interest both the public good and the private right of citizens. This is true particularly of direct democracy consisting of a small number of citizens who assemble and administer the government in person. It is easy in this case for a majority faction to form and be animated by common passion or interest. And there would be nothing to check the inducement to sacrifice the weaker party or an obnoxious individual. If this inducement becomes compelling, neither religious nor moral motives can then be relied upon to save the situation. So neither religious motives or moral motives can check the action by the majority faction from sacrificing public good or private rights of others. Alternatively, the majority faction may perhaps happen to be just containing several small factions. In such a case, a serious threat is posed to the smooth functioning of the popular government. Additionally, there is also the danger of private interests interest eclipsing collective good. It need not be pointed out that every individual has his own passion or interest which molds the way he thinks and acts. When he speaks in the public, he is most likely to express his views that reject, reflect his interest or passion. Similarly, when he acts in public, passion or interest exerts more control over his conduct than general or remote considerations of policy, utility, or justice. This is also true of groups and political parties when common passion or interest bring, bring them together for political action. Perhaps one can rely on the wise counsel of enlightened statesmen for protecting the republic from contrary pulls and pushes of partisan politics. However, they are not always available for advice and guidance, nor is it is certain that their wise counsel would be heeded at all when the passion of partisan politics invades man's better judgment. Thus, opinions of individuals and groups of individuals, including also those of legislators, are usually expressions of self-interest, often biased. Not infrequently, they express the views of those whose integrity has been corrupted, as we find ourselves in this country. The result is that self-regarding opinions have divided mankind into parties, inflamed them with mutual animosity, and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress than to cooperate.
the division of society into rival factions and parties is likely to give rise to two different situations, either a dominant majority faction or a badly splintered space of public opinion. In the case of the former, the majority would most likely use its power to benefit itself at the cost of both individual rights and public good. If the space of public opinion is badly splintered, coalitions of different factions proves difficult. This is likely to lead either to recurrent crises of deadlock in the making of public choices or to intrigues, manipulations, and horse trading by ambitious, vindictive, and rapacious politicians. All this makes it necessary to guard against the confusion of the multitude. <coughs> also, when popular governments become turbulent and very prone to instability, violation of individual rights, and the eclipsing of public good becomes possible. This gives added weight to Madison's observation that it is of great importance in a republic not only to guard the society against the oppressions of its rulers, but also to guard one part of the society against the injustice of other parts. And to save the rights of individuals or of the minority from interested combinations of the majority. This exigency calls for a political solution. And it, the Constitutional Convention did just that. So the founding fathers of American Constitution thought they opted for a solution that would prevent, on the one hand, the formation of a permanent majority, and on the other, obviate the possibility of concentration of power into one political organ. The political institutional device capable of realizing these double-pronged double objectives was considered to be the one that offered the expedient of, for extending the sphere of popular government and reconciling the advantage of monarchy with those of republicanism. And that is what is meant by representative democracy. Such a device was found in the principle of democratic republic. The, the device was based on the principle of representation of the people that would incorporate the idea of democracy. To be sure, however, to prevent the confusion of the multitude, it would be necessary to empower a chosen body of citizens, a small body, whose wisdom may discern the true interest of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial consideration. All these things have happened despite these expectations. Thus, the American Constitution, Constitutional Convention preferred a technical device for governments among large populations because Limitation to a small and chosen body of citizens was to serve as the great purifier of both interest and opinion, to guard against the confusion of the multitude. This technical device allowed regular distribution of power among distinct departments. The introduction of legislative balance and checks, the institution of courts composed of judges holding their office during good behavior, the representation of the people in the legislatures by deputies of their own choice. The adoption of this device put paid to the case of popular government or democracy, where a small number of citizens <coughs> assembled and registered the government in person. This solution retained the principle of representation, but sacrificed pure democracy. This solution 
paid a heavy cost. The cost of what many cast calls the victory of democratic ideology over democracy. It signifies a political order where power and freedom part company. It is this separation of power and freedom that stimulated Thomas Jefferson to react and propose an alternative to it. No, an alternative that would bring them together in peace and harmony. At first, he insisted that the Constitution was not a permanent, unchangeable document. He criticized those who looked at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence and deemed them like the Ark of Covenant, too sacred to be touched. He poo-pooed the idea of permanent constitution as plain vanity and presumptions, presumptions to govern beyond the grave. He asserted that nothing is unchangeable but the inherent rights of rebellion and revolution. For him, revolution was necessary because no government stays for long on the path of virtue. Sooner or later, it is tempted to test its power and in doing so, it frequently dips its fingers in the muck of oppression and the warmth of blood and robs the people it rules over of their tran tranquility, resources.